everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, good turnout. Um, very nice to have Dr. Howe today. He works with artificial gravity. And believe it or not, he does this for fun. That's for fun. The Nobody most, pays me for this. Right. And that's the most amazing thing. So um, no further ado, I'm just going to give the word to Dr. Howe. And yeah, um, yeah. Thank you so much. OK. Thank you for inviting me. I have 100 slides in about 40 minutes, so some of these are going to go very fast. But keep it informal. You know, if you have a question, you know, interrupt me. It's not too much. <laughs> um, hopefully, you all realize that this picture is very much tongue in cheek. This is not a proposal. Um, but the inspiration for that hopefully will be obvious in a couple of minutes here. Um, why did I get in? Oops, went too fast. Why did I get involved in this stuff? Well, I, I graduated from architecture school, actually. All of my degrees say architecture. I became a computer programmer in the College of Architecture, and that's how I earn my living now. But back in the 70s, they started publishing these concepts for space colonies for 10,000 people living in orbit at the L4, L5 liberation point, Earth Moon liberation. Um, Gerard O'Neill, a physicist at Princeton, was a big proponent of these things. So these were products of something called the, the, uh, the summer study, 1975 summer study that happened at Stanford University. So on the left we have the Stanford torus, and on the right we have a variation of it called the Bernal sphere. And they're presenting these very sort of suburban American <coughs> concepts for people living in space. And I looked at that and I said, I don't know, that doesn't, that doesn't look right to me. You know, it's, it's very amazing and compelling to look at, but I have my questions about whether that's the, what you should build in that space. So I got curious about researching it. It became my doctoral dissertation a few years later. Why do we want artificial gravity? Because we were not evolved to live like this. And people have known that for decades. Since, since long before anybody actually flew in space, they knew or they suspected this might not be healthy and might not even be survivable for more than a few hours. So the concept of artificial gravity is actually very old. It goes back to pre-20th century. This is a concept by a German, uh, Hermann Ganschwitt, around 1890. His, he knew that when they shut this engine off, that the astronauts in here would be weightless. And so his concept was that this thing would rotate end over end to produce artificial gravity once that engine cut off. He didn't think gaseous exhaust would be sufficient. So his concept was that these were like uh, steel pellets were the exhaust to get enough momentum in his concept. So he didn't fully understand space, but he understood gravity and artificial gravity and weightlessness. He may or may not have been the first concept. The Tsiolkovsky usually, usually gets the credit for being first. He started publishing space concepts in 1878, if I remember correctly. And this is something he published in 1903 for an artificial gravity habitat with a big greenhouse on the side here. A lot was going on in Europe in the 1920s. The, Austrian Space Society, German Rocket Society, German Space Society. They, people kept publishing these huge concepts, you know, for these huge space structures before, decades before Sputnik flew. People had this concept. Uh, this is by Hermann Nordung, his Wanrad, which translates to Living Wheel, 1928. He had, you know, ideas about what the spiral stairs would look like going into the center. And you'd be weightless in the center, but you'd have gravity at the edge. Uh, von Braun is largely responsible for popularizing this idea of a torus because this was, this was published in a weekly magazine called Collier's, which had a wide circulation in those days, a very famous um, series of articles on space habitation. Again, before Sputnik ever flew, he was designing these things, sort of specking them out. Um, but the concept, when you got into the details, they sort of looked like submarines, you know, very sort of solid and bulky, and it wasn't clear how you were going to get this thing into space. Um, Herman Oberth, who's a very interesting fellow who I'll mention later, um, he had other ideas for how to build in space. He realized these could be very airy, lightweight structures. They didn't have to be these massive submarine battleship looking things. But again, he has concepts for things in zero gravity, things out here spinning for artificial gravity, space telescopes and whatnot. Um, again, Von Braun, you know, this concept of the Taurus really stuck and it showed up on base uh, uh, bubblegum trading cards. 1958, one year after Sputnik, the space race is on. And uh, so here's this concept for a space uh, supply depot. Even if they didn't understand artificial gravity or why the thing would be shaped like that, they knew that that's what a space station would look like. I mean, if you look closely, there's a guy standing here waving. 
If this thing was spinning, of course, he'd be off, you know, in infinity someplace. So, but people just knew that a space station would be shaped this way. That was the image they had in their mind, largely because of those Collier's articles by von Braun. Um, this is now uh, very soon to um, blanking out uh, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. We're almost up to Gagarin, and they're getting serious about designing space stations. They're thinking more about how they're actually going to get this thing in orbit. So this is the axis, and it's now made out of straight cylindrical cylinders that, they, that look like rockets and look like something that could be assembled in space and rotate like this. Here's a concept for a six-sided torus. And the clever thing with this is it folded up. They would launch it in this folded state, get it into space, and unfold it. And they knew that these straight segments were going to be a problem for centripetal acceleration, so their concept was they were going to build these sort of arc, stepped arcs within that straight segment to keep the floor normal to the centripetal acceleration. Because the gravity, the artificial gravity, is always pointed toward the center of rotation. It's not necessarily normal to a straight floor, right? You need a curved floor to feel level. I'll talk more about that later, too. Um, inflatable space stations, I think if you zoom in on this, I suspect that's a Goodyear logo, although I'm not quite sure. It looks like basically a big tire. Um, tethered concepts, two-body things, you know, so they're getting away from this bulky submarine sort of thing and, and looking at how they can build lightweight things that they can launch on rockets and deploy in space and get enough radius to get comfortable gravity. Uh, and this was a concept for a 50-man station in 1969, and this thing was supposed to be up there by 1980, actually. Here's an interesting article from uh, Aviation Week in Space Technology. NASA aims at 100-man station. These were the heady days of right after Apollo 8. You know, we'd been to the moon, we orbited the moon, we were about to land on the moon, and all this stuff was happening. And early plans for smaller stations are rejected by responsible <coughs> officials as being too conservative in size, scope, and potential accomplishments. So, uh, you know, we we're supposed to have this base by 1980, this 12 man by 1980 and 100 by, or 12 by 75, excuse me, and 100 by 1980. Well, that didn't happen, unfortunately. So what happened? Microgravity became the mission. A lot of those early concepts, you know, they thought the space station was going to be for Earth observation or for astronomy, or for defense, they saw them as forts, you know, military, you know, coming after World War II. Nobody thought about artificial or microgravity as being a thing. It was just a nuisance. You know, they knew it, they suspected it would be unhealthy, they knew it would be a nuisance for trying to do any work. And so nobody really thought about going there for microgravity, but it sort of happened as manned missions got longer and longer. They realized, okay, we can survive for a few hours, we can survive for a few days, we can survive for a few weeks months, and on and on it went, and they thought, well, microgravity is actually kind of interesting. So that's what happened with space stations. The Salyuts from 1971 to 1991, so this is not what anybody thought a space station was going to look like, you know, 50 years earlier. Skylab, Mir, you know, they all look sort of similar, all clearly, you know, not built for artificial gravity. They're built for microgravity. And artificial gravity would mess up the mission, right? They're after that microgravity. They're after these, you know, doing crystals and pharma pharmacological stuff. And, and they don't want gravity interfering with things. They don't even want the vibration of people bouncing around in there. International Space Station. So two things have happened with our experience in weightlessness. Um, First of all, we found out it is survivable. And second of all, we found out how unhealthy it really is. I mean, people only had a vague idea of what would happen in microgravity. And now, after decades of doing this, we have a pretty good idea. And there's a real laundry list of things that go wrong, beginning with fluid redistribution. And it's sort of a domino effect. It's like a, like a cascade failure of things that go wrong with the human body when this fluid moves out of your feet and legs and up into your chest. All these things, you lose fluid, you lose electrolytes, um, your heart during the first 24 hours expands and then you lose fluid and it shrinks. You lose red blood cells, interocular, and we keep discovering new things like the interocular hypertension, that, that you know, damaging eyes after, after, we didn't know that for decades and now just in the past few years they've discovered that. Muscle atrophy, bone demineralization, hypercalcemia. So if you try to fix bones by adding calcium to the diet, 
you're increasing their chance of getting kidney stones. I mean, the problem is the bones aren't holding onto the minerals they have. And putting more minerals in the blood isn't necessarily going to make things better. It might make things worse. Uh, immune suppression, cell membrane thickening, you know, on and on it goes. Um, you lose your sense of smell because your head gets stuffy. You can't smell or taste food anymore. Uh, flatulence, so maybe it's a good thing you can't smell anymore. Um, postural changes, coordination changes, lots and lots of stuff. And so if we're going to go into space for a long time, if we're going to go there to live, we need to do something about all this stuff. So back to the future. Um, I hope you're all somewhat familiar with the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. I hope everybody's seen that movie. If you haven't, see it. Um, again, this was like, it came out like weeks or months after Apollo 8 orbited the moon. And we were going to do all these things were going to happen by, you know, 2001. We were going to have these things. This is one of the most realistic depictions of artificial gravity I've ever seen on film. It's a very weird movie. It's very strange at the beginning and very strange at the end, but the middle part is kind of realistic. So. Um, this is a, actually an architectural um, concept. This Paolo Soleri is well known among the architectural community of doing sort of conceptual things. And it's interesting that this is before the Stanford Tourist. You might think, well, this was inspired by O'Neill, but it's actually several years before O'Neill started publishing stuff. I don't know what these crazy flying buttresses are and all that stuff. He's got you know, some weird architectural ideas. But it is this idea of this architectural community in, in free orbit, or you know, an architectural thing in free orbit, a village of some sort, farming, manufacturing going on, black void of space. So um, the Stanford Taurus, as I mentioned, 1975, O'Neill, Gerard O'Neill really popularized this idea. I mean, people knew about it earlier, but O'Neill sort of repopularized it and really sort of brought it into respectability by getting NASA. He, you know, he published his first paper that he sent to Physics Today was rejected, actually, uh, and he had to resubmit it. But then he got NASA on board, and they did a series of three summer studies to look at these things. And they decided this was all buildable with 1970s technology, 1970s materials. Not technology entirely, because we don't know how to get it up there. But in terms of the strength of materials, we knew what you know, aluminum and steel could actually support that kind of structure. Uh, Bernal Sphere, as I mentioned, 1975. These big O'Neill cylinders, he had a series of these things, starting with a colony of 10,000, and their chief thing would be to build the next colony for 100,000, and they would build the colony for a million. And, you know, using all the resources of the asteroids, and ultimately we could build several times Earth's land area in, in space, just using space materials. But again, I look at these things and I think, is that really, you know, architecturally is, I don't see taking an American suburb and transplanting it into this cylinder. There's a, there's a disconnect somehow. Uh, movies, of course, they, they like to include artificial gravity, but a lot of them have, don't have a clue. So Moonraker, for example, that was a, a, a James Bond movie. These spokes are running off at all different crazy directions, and the shuttles are docking all different crazy ways. And how the gravity works is anybody's guess. But, uh, you know, uh, commercial firms are getting into it. Shimizu is a major, you know, Japanese architecture engineering construction firm, and they started publishing space hotel concepts. There was a, there was a conference on space tourism in 1997 that I attended, and this was one of the things that was presented. And WATG, that's a major architectural firm, one of these big global architectural firms. You know, they're sort of dipping their toe in the water. They don't quite know what they're doing, but they see it as the future. They, they, they do resort architecture. That's why they're interested in space resorts. Armageddon, one of the most worst movies I ever saw. <laughs> Very, if you like noise, yeah, go see it. If you like lots of just, just you know, noise. Um, they have no idea how the gravity works, you know, because that wouldn't be a corridor, that would be a, you know, if it was spinning, that tube would be a, an elevator, it wouldn't be a flat thing that you would walk on, but anyway. And Elysium, I didn't get to see this movie, but it looks interesting, just based on that picture. Um, anyway, so I like to quote two people, you know, when, I, when we talk about the architecture of these things, how do we go about studying these things? Vitruvius was an architect in the first century BC. He's famous for writing the 10 books of architecture, which he presented to Augustus Caesar. And one of his things that he said was, if our designs for private houses are to be correct, we must at the outset take note of the countries and climates in which they are built. That was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true today. 
And Oberth, who I mentioned previously, it seemed necessary to make this point to enable me to deal with the objection that people of this kind would never be found on the earth, but only in the mind of a moonstruck individual, one-third mentally deranged by fantasies of space travel, and two-thirds lost to realities in a maze of mathematics. Well, there is some math. We need to know some math. It's not too terrible. Uh, these are two very important equations, this formula for centripetal acceleration and Coriolis acceleration. And it's important to know where these things come from. This is not a case of observing something rotating and taking measurements and finding a formula that sort of fits what we measured. These are purely mathematical derivations. If you take, if you write the formula for the inertial position of a particle in a rotating frame of reference and take the second derivative with respect to time, right? Acceleration, that's what comes out. It's strictly a mathematical, you know, taking two derivatives of the position of a rotating particle in, in inertial space. And if that particle is moving in that rotating reference, then we get a second term, which is the Coriolis acceleration. But the, there's no mystery about where these come from. These are not some kind of mysterious force that don't fit, you know, gravity, strong nuclear, weak nuclear, electromagnetic. It's not some weird fifth or sixth force that you rotate something and this mysterious centrifugal force arises from the ether. No, it doesn't happen. Um, it's strictly a mathematical derivation. And the ratio of Coriolis to centripetal is an interesting thing, too. It turns out to be twice the ratio of the relative velocity to the tangential velocity, which will show up again later. So um, NASA got serious about this in the 60s. They actually built some, uh, some rotating space station simulators. And hopefully I can switch here to a nice, where's my cursor? Oops, there is my cursor. I want to get, there it is. There we go. OK, so um, there's a nice thing on YouTube. This one, yep. This one here. Please sort of run. Ah, oh well. I'm not on the network. All right, well, take my word for it. If you want this, there's, there's a nice link on my website. They have, a, they have a very nice YouTube video of this rotating thing and this astronaut walking, and he's in this weird suspension thing that holds him horizontally. And he walks around while this thing is rotating at different speeds. I didn't get myself on the network here, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. Let me return to our previously scheduled entertainment here. Okay. So they built, they had this one at, at NASA Langley Research Center. It was dismantled after the Apollo thing, and NASA went through this huge downsizing, and they dismantled this thing in the early 70s. Um, but a lot of studies were done to figure out what is comfortable rotation. And this shows up in a lot of papers. This is the most cited version of this comfort chart I've seen. I've seen it in like four or five different publications. Um, briefly, what's going on here, this is a log-log graph, so all the lines are straight instead of being, you know, parabolas or whatever. This is 4 RPM. They're saying you should be below 4 RPM. We should be above 20 feet per second. You want a high tangential velocity, so you're walking back and forth. Doesn't make a lot of difference to your gravity. The bigger the tangential velocity, the, the more consistent it'll be for your motion. Um, this seems to be just some crazy arbitrary value on their log scale. 0.035 g is probably useless. Most people put it at least 0.3 g. Um, there is no upper limit. The higher, the bigger the radius, the better. No reason to go above one gravity. So we're sort of between 1 g and some, something less than 1 g, 20 feet per second according to this one, tangential velocity and below 4 RPM. But there are different graphs with different limits, and they're hard to compare <coughs> because they all choose different formats. You really have to study these things to figure out what's going on. So this one distinguishes between comfort and optimum comfort. They say optimum is below 2, but comfort could be as high as 6, according to this one. And this one also puts 6 at the top versus 4. This is pretty much the same format as the first one, except they've swapped the axes. And this one has all different kinds of limits for walking, climbing, material handling, postural balance. It's hard to figure out you know, what this is trying to say in the end. 
Um, this one is interesting because they have a limit for what a tether can carry. So they have limits for 10,000 pound tether and 20,000 pound tether. So they actually put a structural limit on their comfort chart, which is interesting. What's feasible? You know, we can't build it infinitely big. The thing has to support its own weight. So. And they put the rotation limit at 3 RPM, I believe. One, well, one two, three, yeah. Most of these things are log scales, so the lines come out straight. So if we take all those things and force them into one format so that we can compare, we get something like this. So comfort isn't one of these things where if I'm here, I'm comfortable, but I go here and all of a sudden I'm vomiting. It doesn't work that way, right? It's a gradual thing. We could take a survey of the people in this room. Some people think it's too hot. Maybe some people think it's too cold. And other people think, you know, just right. Um, and that's the way comfort works. So uh, gr the green zone is everybody, all those six people agree that this area is comfortable. And as we get lower and lower G, there's more and more, you know, disagreement. But below here, everybody agrees it's not comfortable or not useful. The rotation rate, everybody agrees that below 2 RPM is fine. 3, most people agree as it goes higher and higher, there's less and less agreement. Until above 6, everybody says, well, that's too high, too fast. People can't adapt or they can't adapt easily. Um, so one of the things I have on my website is this little, I call it SpinCalc. It's an artificial gravity calculator written in JavaScript, and it's on the web. And you can specify any two of these parameters, and it will compute the other two for you. And it will give you a little indication of whether it conforms to those comfort charts according to, you know, the centripetal acceleration should be at least so much, but not more than 1G. Tangential velocity should be high. Angular velocity should be low. Radius, um, radius is a factor because it affects the so-called gravity gradient. If you have a short radius, your head is at a less gravity than your feet are, and there's some concern that that could cause discomfort. So we basically want a big radius for comfort. You want a big radius, a fast tangential velocity, a low angular velocity, and you know if, if we could build it infinitely large, that's what we would do, and we and it would be like Earth. It would be very similar to Earth. This is an animation, and hopefully this will run at least. Uh, this is, I call this one Spin Doctor, and if you've got a Mac, if you're running OS 10, you can download this. I wrote this like 30 years ago on Apollo workstations in Fortran, but it's, some people maintain old cars, some people maintain old software, okay? So, <laughs> so I, I like to keep this one running. So just to give you an idea what this looks like. I'll get myself back over to here and unpause this thing. So this window is, a, is an inertial view of somebody in some kind of rotating environment. This is a control panel. This is what that guy sees relative to himself, and this is his identical twin on Earth who's going to do the same experiment. So if we just drop a ball, that's what happens. So this is, we know this is outside the comfort zone. This is like, a, you know, almost 10 RPM, 9.5 RPM for 1G, very small radius, very high angular velocity. The thing to notice is that the particles are moving in straight lines, right? You let go of the particle, there's no magic centrifugal force that pushes it, or there's no Coriolis force that pushes it around. It's just momentum. So this deviation here, that's not being caused by any kind of Coriolis force. That is an illusion. It's the, it's the observer that's rotating, not the path of the ball. And we can do interesting things here. We can, we can throw the ball and get interesting loop-de-loops. So if I drag that thing down and drag a little vector here. It's interesting if you go sort of against the rotation. You can get really wild sorts of behavior. <laughs> And so uh, it gives you an idea why that might not be comfortable, right? It's not behaving like Earth gravity. And the point I'm always trying to make is we have to, as designers, we have to be aware of this thing. You cannot approach the design of an artificial gravity habitat as if it's gravity. It's Earth gravity? Okay, Earth. Design it like Earth. No, cannot do that. I am a vocal opponent of that whole idea. So let's see. Let me get back to here. Back to my oops, slides. Okay, so here's a diagram of what's going on. Here's the guy, he's holding a particle two meters high. He lets go of it. 
there's no force, it's just momentum. It travels in a straight line until it hits the floor again. There is no centrifugal force pushing this thing out to the edge. It's a myth. There's no Coriolis force that's bending it. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. If he continued holding on to the particle, it would travel this arc S. But since he let go of it, it travels a straight line, that same distance but on a, on a cord. Right? So the time that it took the particle to go here, he rotated that far. And so that's why the particle is landing off to the side. It's just trigonometry. And so that's what it looks like. And that curvature is dependent on the ratio of the height to the radius. It doesn't matter how fast it's spinning. It doesn't matter how much gravity it is. It's strictly the geometry, the ratio of the height to the particle versus the height to the, to the center point. And the bigger the ratio is, the more it deviates. The smaller the ratio, the straighter it is. This is what happens if we launch a particle from the floor. So it's got a tangential velocity, and let's say we give it some impulse straight up off the floor. The particle's cutting a cord through there. Um, it had this tangential velocity, and the observer still has that same tangential velocity. So he rotates through this arc during the same time <coughs> as the particle hits that. So now the particle's going to the other side. It's going to land on what I would say is the east versus the west. And here, the shape of the curve is related to this ratio of V over V. So the bigger the ratio, the bigger the relative velocity to the tangential velocity of the station, the more distorted this curve gets. So we want a big V, big capital V versus the little V. So big ratio, big deviation. Now here we're holding the ratio constant, but we are varying the centripetal acceleration. And so you notice all these curves have the same shape, because the shape depends on that ratio, but the overall size depends on how strong the gravity is. Weaker gravity, higher jump. So here's Earth gravity. I drop a particle, it falls straight down. These spots are at tenth of a second intervals. Now we can take this comfort chart, and we can sort of do these these two experiments at each of these boundary points of this comfort chart to get an idea of what does the gravity look like, what's it going to feel like. So up here, this is the most Earth normal point. It's full 1G, big radius, low angular velocity. He drops a particle. He jumps off the floor at 2 meters per second. Looks very Earth-like. Right? There's Earth for comparison. It deviates a little bit, but not much. Um, but down here, where we're hitting the maximum RPM, and then we're below 1G, it's pretty distorted. And that's where all the pressure is to design for, because it's the cheapest. The minimum radius and tangential velocity means minimum mass and energy. And so that's where all the pressure is economically. They want, you know, that's what everybody wants to design for, to make it feasible. For the, you know, not for colonies, but colonies are never going to happen unless we build something smaller first. So uh, if we take the... Uh, each of these authors, if we take that point in each of their graphs, what is the minimum radius and tangential velocity that each of those comfort chart authors propose? This is sort of the spread that we get. They're all pretty distorted. They all permit within their idea of comfort quite a bit of distortion compared to Earth normal. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, let's applications. Let's, if, we, if we're playing basketball in our rotating space colony, um, here I am at the free throw line. If I'm in a little 10-meter station and I throw the basketball, it's going to come back and hit me in the heels. <laughs> it's going to completely loop around. But the other three, 100, 1,000, 10,000, probably makes the shot if it's a you know, decent-sized station. If we get closer under the net, even the 100-meter shot misses. And even at a 1,000-meter radius, the centroid of that ball misses the, misses the hoop. So he might miss that shot. You know, you can say, well, he's going to jump and stuff it. Well, if he jumps, he's a particle, right? He's doing what the basketball is doing. And he's a lumpy sort of segmented particle. But once he's in the air, you know, you know gravity or, you know, momentum takes over. So This is what happens if you walk, if you try to walk on a flat floor or a straight segment in a rotating environment. So it's rotating this way. We have the centripetal acceleration. And we have this Coriolis component, component, which is always perpendicular to your relative motion. So if I'm walking this way and it's rotating this way, there's a Coriolis acceleration that's always perpendicular to the floor. It's perpendicular to my travel. It's, it, the, the formula is 2 omega cross v, 2 omega being the 
the angular velocity and v, the relative linear velocity. So what that does essentially is it, it, all, the, all the acceleration vectors converge on a point here above where the actual center of rotation is. And if he reverses direction and walks the other way, the Coriolis acceleration reverses, and so that convergent point comes down. And so if we look at that relative, you know, what does he see in his field? Because for him, this is vertical, and that's horizontal. So this is what he feels. And this curve turns out to be a catenary. It turns out to be, if you take a wire and let it hang by its own weight, you get that catenary curve, you know, uh, hyperbolic cosine. Have that math, you know, good math. Um, cosh, right? Omega squared cosh. So what he sees is this straight segment, but what he feels is it's like he's climbing a hill and it's only level in the middle. And as he gets to the other end, it, you know, it goes downhill again because those acceleration vectors are converging on that point. And the interesting thing is if he reverses direction, the strength of the gravity is less, but the apparent slope of that floor is steeper. So it's sort of an interesting sort of dichotomy there. And climbing a ladder is another, it's the same thing basically. You're traveling on a straight cord and a rotating thing. So, uh, you know, we have the centripetal acceleration, we have Coriolis acceleration, so the, the acceleration vectors are converging here. He needs to be on the correct side of that ladder when he's climbing it. He wants to be on the top of that curve. You don't want to be down here like this, hanging underneath that ladder with the Coriolis force pulling the ladder away from you. You want it pushing the ladder into you. And it's amazing how many concepts either ignore this or get this wrong. Um, but if you're, if you're doing a multi-story artificial gravity habitat, you want to pay attention to which side of the ladder you're ascending and which side you're descending. And there are different solutions for that. You can have one ladder but make it accessible from both sides. Or you can save a little floor space by putting two ladders in there and have one for up and one for down. But you, we have to pay attention to these details. Or you can, you know, put them completely on opposite sides of the, uh, of the habitat. And uh, also, if you're building flat floors, you know, if, if this is wide relative to the radius, there's going to be a little bit of a floor slope. So again, this is looking at what is the, what's the, the maximum of the minimums. In other words, all the authors agree that this radius and this tangential velocity are comfortable. And we get something like that. It's not too severe, but you can see it. Um, it shows up more on climbing that ladder. Uh, you know, again, he, we have to pay attention to how that ladder is oriented and which side he's climbing on. He does not want to be on this side of the ladder. So this is a concept that was uh, put to a very nice animation, actually very convincing, but not quite perfect. Um, Binodal, binodal uh, nuclear thermal reactor artificial gravity Mars mission. I forget exactly what BNTR is. But anyway, this is a transhab module for the habitat, and this is some counterweight, and it's rotating around here, I think. And um, they were not at the maximum of the minimums. They were assuming, you know, Mars gravity and 4 RPM. So if we look at that and analyze that, and this is, a, this is a very convincing animation. You know, this is an animated character that they did walking, you know, climbing this ladder, but it doesn't work. She, the, the simple solution is to put another ladder on the other side of this opening, but you have to be aware of these things and think about them because the floor slope, given those numbers, at the edge of the habitat is going to be 13 degrees. That's really steep, actually. Um, that's quite steep. And the ladder is going to seem to be leaning six degrees. It'll work going down, but it won't work going up, or vice versa. It'll work in one direction, but it'll be wrong in the other direction. So you need two ladders or one ladder that's accessible from both sides. Uh, 2001, looking at this again, you know, great movie, but they got this wrong because they got the ladder in that plane. The ladder is rotating like this. So in the middle, up here, there is no centripetal acceleration. It's all Coriolis, and it's all in the plane of the ladder. And so this is what he's going to feel when he tries to climb that ladder. And the top, he's going to be like this. And it doesn't sort of straighten up until he gets close to the, close to the perimeter. Because up here, it's all Coriolis. And it's all you know, perpendicular to the direction he's going in. So um, and here's a concept for a variable gravity research station. And they, you know, I, it's amazing how often they get, it's almost like they try to get it wrong. And when I, you know, when I look at this, I make a big deal about ladders. But if we sort of parse this out, we say, well, there's these big dishes. They're probably pointed at something. They're probably pointed at some fixed reference. So I assume it's rotating this way. 
right? So those have a fixed reference, which means that ladder is in the plane of rotation again. You know, turn it, just put it over here, you know, and put two of them in or something. Um, so um, recommendations. There are basically, if we're building our thing out of straight cylindrical modules, we sort of have three orientations we can talk about. There's axial, where our, our module is parallel to the axis of rotation. This is probably the most comfortable. There's, I said no, some people quarrel with me about the no. Okay, minimal Coriolis. There's always going to be some, but it's minimized if you're in this orientation. Because motion parallel to the axis, there's no Coriolis. Coriolis is always perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So no or very little Coriolis. You don't have to worry about sloping the floor. It's all equidistant from the axis. Very little floor curvature. I mean, it's going to curve a little bit this way, but that's the narrow dimension. You don't need ladders, hopefully, if it's one story. No gravity gradients. But unfortunately, mechanically, it might be the least stable because this thing wants to twist into the tangential orientation. It wants to sort of reorient itself like that. So this is sort of intermediate. And of course, toruses, if you have a complete torus, it's a, basically a special case of this, right? It's a, a lot of these things connected together in a ring. So it's sort of intermediate. There is some Coriolis force if you're walking pro or against the rotation. There's going, you have to have either build a curved floor or, or deal with the fact that the floor is going to feel sloped. Um, but hopefully if it's one story, there's no ladders, there's not much gravity gradient, and it's medium stable. It has to be balanced, but, um, you know, the easiest to build probably and the least comfortable is the radial. Um, there's Coriolis acceleration no matter what you do. You're in a, you have a circular plan, which means that when you're in that, every direction looks the same, and you can't orient yourself to which way it's rotating, which is going to make it hard to adapt, I think. That's my, my hypothesis, anyway. You need ladders, which means you've got to deal with all these Coriolis effects when you're climbing and going down. Gravity gradients from, you know, you're going to have less gravity at the upper deck than at the lower deck. Um, but there's all these trade-offs, you know, what can we afford to build what, and versus what would we like to build. And there's always compromises. But you have to be aware of what the compromises are. Uh, as an architect, I, I mentioned this a minute ago, I, I think when we get into the details of designing the interiors of these things, we have to help people adapt. People can adapt, but we have to meet them halfway. We cannot design it like Earth because it's not going to feel that way. People are going to be very aware of the difference between walking with or against the rotation or turning their head, they're going to get these effects. So what can we do with the interior design of these things to keep people adapted? And I, I'm, I'm strongly against having a circular plan where every direction looks the same. Prograde and retrograde emerge as gravitationally distinct, just like up and down. I mean, I wouldn't confuse a ceiling with a floor. On rotating environments, especially at small radii, we cannot confuse prograde and retrograde. Those are gravitationally distinct. And I think they have to be marked somehow. They have to, people have to know when they look at it. Because if we were on a rotating environment now and you're sitting in your chairs, you feel fine. If you're not moving, you don't notice it. But as soon as you get up, sit down, turn your head, you're going to feel these weird effects that are you know, pushing you out of the seat or pulling you back into it or whatever. And so if, if we can do something visually to keep people oriented, they can adapt. Um, and so this was sort of an, an idea that I threw out for lack of anything better. But the first one here, this is a, you know, a room without any differentiation, just a windowless room on Earth. All the walls are the same. Who cares? North, south, east, west doesn't make any difference. And uh, if we wanted to somehow change that for artificial gravity, what could we do? We might play with the shape of the lighting grid. We can play with colors and shapes and lots of stuff, lots of visual cues to keep people oriented. You don't have to be obnoxious about it, but something that's consistent and noticeable and just, just beyond, um, you know, subtle but not too subtle to keep people oriented. Um, so there are trade-offs. Uh, we want to decrease the radius, velocity, mass, and energy. That's where economics is pushing. But that's going to be, that's going to require an increase in research. What can people adapt to? Um, testing. Uh, lots of design reviews, more selectivity on the crew. You might have a very competent geologist that you'd like to send to Mars, but he gets nauseous below, you know, above 3 RPM. You know, so there's all these compromises, training and acclimatization. If we could build it huge, we would. That would be the best thing. 
Um, the habitat pressure shell does not shield the interior from physics and mechanical dynamics. What I see in a lot of these concepts is, you know, mechanical engineers wouldn't make these mistakes. They understand Coriolis forces. They understand, um, you know, Euler's, and Euler's equations of motion and all. But somehow when it gets to the interior design, they take this hole that they've designed and they throw it over the wall. And interior designers on the other side catch it. They don't know any of this stuff. And so they just do, oh, artificial gravity. Okay, let's make it pretty and... And, uh, you know, but there has to be more communication between these groups because um, all of those uh, things that affect the overall structure affect everything inside the structure, including the people, including the crew. So curved floors that are wide relative to the rotation radius. I reject circular plans with no obvious orientation to the direction of rotation. Use color and pattern to provide visual orientation to distinguish east from west. Uh, avoid multi-story designs with all the gravity gradients and ladders and all the problems that they have. If you have to have ladders, place them coplanar to the axis of rotation. So the axis of rotation should be in the ladder. So the ladder is rotating like this, not like that. You don't want your ladder rotating this way. You want it rotating this way. And provide either separate ladders or two-sided access for ascending and descending. Uh, question all assumptions about gravity, which basically means question everything. <laughs> And uh, here's URLs for these, this calculator and the, the, the animation that I showed. Um, I can give those to you later if you want them. Uh, so going back to these things, when we look at this, we have to understand this is a metaphor. This is not a construction specification. This made sense in the 70s because we want to communicate there's houses in space. If I draw some bizarre thing that nobody recognizes as a house, it ain't going to sell. Right? So we know what a house is. We look at a house. Okay, I know what it does. I know how big it is. It tells a story, but it is not a construction specification. This is not what we're going to build. And finally, a uh, couple of quotes from my favorite authors here again. Such things do not exist and cannot exist and never have existed. Yet when people see these frauds, they find no fault with them, but on the contrary are delighted and do not care whether any of them can exist or not. In Oberth, other laws prevail in space, and there is no reason why the old architectural rules should be followed. And that's it. Awesome. We have 10 minutes for questions. Um, questions? So I'm sure you've seen The Martian. Yes. So there's this Not as soon as all you others saw it, but I did finally see it. Yeah. So there is this scene in the middle of the movie where one of the astronauts is on this big wheel in the spaceship on a treadmill running, I think, either like a program or it's in line with the rotation, would she be having problems? Well, since on a treadmill, you're not really moving that much, so it probably doesn't matter a whole lot how the treadmill is oriented, but I would tend to probably orient it you know, with the rotation. So if there was any back and forth, um, and I'd probably orient it so that you tended to run with the rotation. So if you, anything, you would gain weight, you wouldn't lose weight. If you lose weight, you know, you can actually lose contact with the floor. You lose friction and bad things can happen. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned the Martian, because Martian, what stuck out in my mind is this, it happened a couple of times in the movie, if you were paying close attention. So they had that zero gravity axis and astronauts were floating through there, right? They, just like on ISS. And somehow, as soon as they got to that spoke, their momentum took a right angle turn. You know, again, as if there was this mysterious centrifugal force that was pulling them down the tube. And that ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. They're going to fly right past it. You know, they are not going to be sucked down by this centrifugal force. It doesn't exist. They have to grab onto something. They need to grab that ladder or something and pull themselves into it. They're not going to do that. But that happened in the movie a couple of times. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, there is a movie called Europa Report. I don't know if you've heard of it. What is um, it? Europa Report. So they're going to Europa. Do you like it? Yeah, um, so they're going to Europa. It's just, it's just a crazy fiction movie about um, alien life in Europa. And there is this, like, right in the beginning when they're starting moving to Europa, the thing is moving, and one of the astronauts is like, oh my gosh, can you please, like, shut the windows or something, because I, I'm getting nauseated just by staring at it. How do you go across it? Can you just, like, actually, like, turn the windows off or something like that and, and then you're not going to feel that? This, that, this is another thing thing that I disagree with a lot of what a lot of people say about windows and rotating environments. Oh, yeah. The leading 
theory for what causes motion sickness, and also simulator sickness, which relates to my actual paid job with virtual reality, is the mismatch between what your eyes are telling you versus what your middle ear is telling you, your inner ear, excuse me, your otolith organs and semicircular canals. They cannot be fooled, right? Those are little accelerometers in the middle of your head, and they know whether you're accelerating or not. Whether you see it or not, your head knows, unless, there's, unless you've been damaged there. And in fact, those comfort studies, it was interesting. There was one subject who had damaged otoliths. He was deaf. He was completely deaf, and he was the least susceptible to motion sickness. He couldn't be made motion sick because those things weren't working anymore. I don't know what his balance was like, whether he had bad balance or not. But yeah, my counter argument is that there should be windows. You're going to feel the rotation, whether you see it or not. So I say, let them see it. You know, it's just part of the adaptation. You should see it and feel it, and then it'll make sense. But the person most likely, or the person least likely to get seasick on a ship is the pilot, because he can see the horizon. He can see how the ship is moving, and he's in control. I've been seasick on Lake Superior, so I speak from experience. You do not want to be in the middle of that boat with no windows, sitting at some funny angle while it's doing this, and you're looking across, and some guys, you know, doing this, and it's, just, it's not fun. Um, you know, I, I stepped out of that room, and I felt better immediately. I mean, fresh air is part of it, but just being able to see the motion. If you put people in a featureless room, and, you know, and you can do simulators with this stuff, I mean, you put them in some featureless room and put it on hydraulics, and have it, you know, jerking around, they're going to get sick. If you give them a window and let them see that they're moving around, I suspect they will be less likely to get sick. So, I mean, I know you can always put curtains or blinds on the windows, or a person can wear one of those, you know, sleep guards or something if they want to, but I say uh, windows, yes. People, don't, people want windows when they go to space. Sort of a tangent, but Skylab, there was a huge battle whether to put a window in Skylab. And the engineers didn't want a window because, you know, it was going to punch this hole in their structure. And it was the human factors people who said, we have to have a window. And that was how they kept their sanity when they're up there for 80 days. I mean, in the space station too, that's where they spend their time, looking out the window. You can't just be looking at a, you know, a, a machine all the time. Yes? On, on something the size of uh, one of the Stanford or uh, Neil things, uh, it strikes me that uh, uh, Coriolis force would actually be fairly small just because the angular Velocity would be very small. So yeah, and it will be. Um, I showed like that basketball example, where even at the scale of uh, uh, an O'Neill cylinder, mm -hmm. if you were close under the net trying to make that shot, you still might miss because it. I mean, it's small, but it's there. It, it will be felt. And also, um, I mean, if you look at from a sort of a cultural standpoint, those aren't going to just happen from no place we're going to go through a whole succession of smaller things before we get to these. And by that time, there's going to be this cultural shift, I think. I mean, my philosophy, if you want to call it that, is the people designing those big colonies are going to be people who lived and experienced smaller colonies where those forces were more noticeable. And, you know, this, this, this image of Midwest American suburbia is just not going to be relevant anymore. By the time we build those things, they're just going to have different imagery, different sense of geometry that, you know, unless you're building Disneyland, you're not going to build that. <laughs> they, they look like Bay Area. I mean, they, they might build amusement parks. This is what, you know, welcome to Earth, and it'll be some Earth-like thing in this huge, to Earth. you know, a simulation of Earth in some big space colony, you know, when, when, when they're billions of miles away and have forgotten what Earth is like, you know. Well, here, this is what Earth was like. You know. But uh, I think, you know, there's, there's just going to be a cultural shift in how we even think about designing these things. And it's going to evolve from much smaller things where these forces are much more relevant. More questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan. Thank you for coming.